Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run the services um, at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated website. So that's information, resources, activities, um, and so on for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and the associated businesses. Um, also importantly for people who want to know more about our business, maybe they want to get a job as a writer or an account manager or whatever. So there's lots of resources to have a look at at first at the medcomsnetworking.com. Um, if you're interested in getting a job, look at first medcomsjob.com. Um, and um, and if you're interested in, in more of these webinars and, and video recordings and so on, um, we're we're up well over 400 video recordings now at Network Pharma TV, um, many of which are based on these sorts of webinars. So uh, lots of um, information, content and resources to go and have a look at. Um, today, absolutely delighted to have the publishers back together again. This is an annual meeting we're running now. Um, so we're going to run this as a panel session. We're going to talk about what's new, what's happening at the individual publishing companies that are represented and more generally what's happening across publishing. Um, as always, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll um, ask the audience to contribute, the live audience today, to contribute via the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, any ideas, con uh, questions, contributions, observations, and so on, we'll weave that into the discussion. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to ask the um, the publishers to introduce themselves and their companies. So we're going to go in alphabetical order as always. So Hamish, uh, over to you first. Please, mate. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Uh, my name is Hamish McDougall, and I'm the Publishing Solutions Manager at Sage Publishing. Uh, my job is essentially to act as a first point of contact for you guys working in medcoms agencies or publications teams from pharmaceutical companies. So any queries, rather than trying to locate journal editors or contacts within Sage, uh, you can approach me directly, either by email or LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to resolve them. Um, in particular, you can use me as contact for things like pre-submission inquiries, uh, which very happy to take at Sage. Um, at Sage, we're also very happy to sit down with you and discuss publication plans early on or throughout the process, uh, so we can help you identify the correct target journals or any digital features that you might be interested in or any manuscript visibility enhancers that you might be interested in. Um, Sage Publishing has over 250 journals in the clinical medicine space, covering the full spectrum of topics in medical science and biotechnology. Uh, we have a wide variety of journals with society titles like Kefalalgia, um, as well as our own in-house titles uh, like the Multiple Sclerosis Journal. Um, we've always been at the forefront of open access publishing as well, uh, offering an array of different options, whether that be offering uh, hybrid open access publishing models for our subscription titles or our, our large portfolio of gold open access journals. In the gold open access journal space, uh, we have our therapeutic advances journals, which we're well known for, uh, and we, which have proved quite popular with Medcoms and Pharma in the past. Um, it's a series of 18 journals covering different therapeutic areas and associated therapeutic developments. Um, all of the journals have in-house managing editors uh, with subject experience, um, as well as their own external editors in chief and editorial boards. Most recently, we launched a rare disease journal in the Therapeutic Advances series uh, called Therapeutic Advances in Rare Disease, uh, which is very, it's doing very well and will be listed on PubMed soon. Uh, it's currently a free to publish uh, open access journal, uh, which is a model we're also exploring with our journal Plasmatology. Uh, this year at Sage, we've continued working on digital feature offerings, as well as looking at different ways to enhance manuscript visibility. Um, and we've also been increasing the number of journals that allow abstract PLS within manuscript. Uh, and next year, we'll be offering abstract PLS across the full portfolio of Sage titles, including all of our hybrid journals. Um, early next year, we'll also be launching our plain language summaries of publications as an article type within our therapeutic advances journals uh, and some selected additional open access titles. Um, we also continue to promote all of our plain language content on our patient accessible research microsite. Uh, so that's all from me. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, great. That's fantastic. And we'll come back to some of those points um, once we've heard from everybody. So, uh, Jan, you're next on the list. Uh, thanks, Peter. And hello, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Jan Seal-Roberts. I'm the Publishing Director for ADIS. 
for those who don't know, ADIS, we are a small portfolio of 32 journals, uh, but we're part of Springer Nature, which hopefully needs no introduction. But ADIS as a separate entity is kept ring fenced because of the specialist nature of what we do, which to publish exclusively on drugs and disease therapy. Um, I work closely with Neve Clark, whom I hope a lot of you know, and also Caroline Halford, who hopefully needs no introduction. Caroline is now increasingly working on the uh, MedEd IME um, side, so hence I'm glad to be here today. Um, AIDIS Journal's main focus tends to be clinical research, no surprise there, um, real world evidence, health economics and outcomes research, but also review articles on drugs and therapeutic interventions. Our most famous journals out of our 32 are probably drugs, um, high impact, um, multidisciplinary, um, advanced in therapy, also um, uh, one of our most popular journals, um, drug safety, uh, pharmacoeconomics, um, clinical pharmacokinetics. Most of these are very well known to most people, um, but we also have a range of therapy specific journals, including targeted oncology, um, drugs therapy, um, and infectious disease and therapy. That's the name, just a few but we have a beautiful brochure and if you ever need any information on any of our titles just give me a shout or any of the team. Things we're most famous for probably for being great. Um, we're very accessible. We love speaking with pharma, agencies, um, other publishers, um, and anything we can do to help, just let us know. Probably our most effective means of, of helping out is our ADIS pre-submission inquiry service that's headed up by Neve Clark. Um, if you send us an outline or an abstract, we'll hope to get back to you within 24 or 48 hours with some possible solutions for your um, data, and then it's up to you what you, what you choose. But with our range of journals, we hope to be able to provide a home for any scientifically sound paper. So just give us a shout. We're always very happy to hear from you. We're almost also famous for our rapid publication. Um, all of our journals aim to provide peer review response within four to six weeks. With our ADIS Rapid Plus journals, we aim to provide a response within two weeks, which is which is quite going some. Um, peer review, um, sorry, uh, that's with, with peer, peer review within two weeks. Uh, and then from acceptance to publication, uh, it's usually three to four weeks. So we are pretty speedy. And if you come to us and um, request our involvement, we will do our best to help you. We've been known to upload upload uh, 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 manuscripts on your behalves um, and just to keep you informed with what's going on. So we're rapid and we're lovely to work with. Um, we're also well known for our independent single agent reviews that we publish under the ADIS drug evaluation banner. These are reviews that ADIS develop ourselves. We've got an expert team of writers um, at our own cost, by the way, peer reviewed and published in our own journals. But we always seek to involve pharma or their agents to ensure accuracy and completeness before they are um, published. So whenever any any new entity is approved for the very first time in the very first market, we'll develop an ADIS Insight report, which is a quick overview of what the drug is, uh, what it's been approved for, and the, uh, the, the data available at the time. That's published within six to eight weeks of first approval within drugs. So it's usually the very first article uh, published post-approval. Post so these are very well received, and we also develop full reviews called ADIS drug evaluations that bring together all the data and look at the place in therapy, usually about 18 months, two years post-approval. And we develop practical guide articles called ADIS Q&A. So that's a big part of what we do as well. Um, we're very well known for our PLS and digital features like, like my colleagues here. Uh, we've been doing them from the get-go. We were the first um, publishers to welcome PLS to all our journals. Uh, and now with digital features too, we can accept them, we can develop them on your behalf, any, any which way we can, we can do to help. And the final thing to say is really the increasing number of patient voice articles and podcasts that we're developing. And we have an increasing number of patient experts on the editorial board um, of our journals. So we're very proud of what we're doing here really to maximise um, the, the sound of the patient voice. Um, so podcast has probably been the big deal this, this, this past year, as well as patient voice articles. And the big news for us this year is that we are now launching our own standalone PLSP that we are pitching at a slightly higher level to the brilliant future science model. So not directly own, um, aimed at patients, but really the usual readership that AIDIS aims at, which is time poor clinicians, non-experts, nurses, auxiliary health, but really anyone who is looking for um, to, to 
inform um, their, their knowledge. So um, that's going to be the big deal for this this year. We are already um, welcoming um, submissions. We've got a few that are currently in development and guidelines are now available. So um, we are now open for business there as well. So very much looking forward to people um, contacting us through uh, me those. So that's everything from me. Back to you, Peter. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, Kelly, you're next on our list. If you'd like to do the same, introduce yourself to sure. me. I just want to thank you all for having me today. I'm standing in for my colleague, uh, Johnny Patience, who is traveling to Singapore with his family for the holidays. I am joining you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I work with Taylor and Francis. I'm a senior editor there. And I'm just like, what does a senior editor do? I have a portfolio of original research, medicine, and health journals. Uh, it's a small portfolio, but we have some very uh, well-recognized journals within it, including Current Medical Research and Opinion, Journal of Medical Economics, and Postgraduate Medicine. I work very closely with the uh, team of editors that work on the Expert Collection Journals, which is a collection of 32 titles uh, covering all ranges of therapy areas. Um, and so, Myself, I'm very interested in the trends and advances in medical research and publishing, but I think that also goes to what Taylor and Francis is very interested in. Um, and I'm particularly passionate about plain language summaries. Anybody who knows me knows that. And uh, I've been delighted to have the opportunity not to only work with Taylor and Francis on those over the past couple of years, but also externally collaborating within the industry, other publishers, medcoms, pharma, biotech. Uh, 2023 marks my 20th year in publishing. I can't believe that. Um, it seems like I just started a couple months ago. I will have been at Taylor and Francis for six years in February. Um, so let's see some highlights from this past year. And I want to go into it first saying our overall key initiatives for Taylor and Francis this year and going into 2023. And I think going on for you know, quite the next few years are a focus on open research and how we make all of our research not we have a collection of medicine health journals, but we have 2500 journals and they cover all aspects of research. And we want to make that as accessible as possible to a very wide global audience in all types of audiences. And again, that's where plain language summaries fit so beautifully into that. We want to create a really fantastic author experience for everyone we work with. We want people to walk away and say, wow, that was wonderful. We loved working with them. We want to come back again. And I guess that's a good this is a good place to say that as everybody else who's here today, uh, we always welcome pre-submission inquiries, any questions. Uh, I think we're really proud of our hands-on approach that we have internal editors that basically come to us, tell us what you need, and we will accommodate that. Uh, so finally, our last bit that we've really been focused on is accessible publishing, and that is not that is accessible publishing in terms of people, especially those with disabilities and chronic illnesses that may not be able to access research in a traditional way. So we're looking at how we can enhance the way that we share our research to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, I'll just very quickly share a couple of um, specific examples that I'm excited to talk about. I feel like an echo in the room here to say that yes, Taylor and Francis is also uh, launching standalone plain language summaries or uh, was it plain language summary of publications? Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Joe Walker here, who has been the pioneer in plain language summaries, and we are all following your lead, Joe, to do the same. Uh, we just got approval for that last week, so we will be uh, launching those in very early 2023. We had our first webinar last Friday on plain language summaries, which is the first in a series of webinars we're going to be offering to the industry on quite a, a collection of topics that are of high interest to those of you in pharma, biotech, and medcoms. And in during that webinar, we also, uh, number three, launched a plain language summary that we're opening up this month and through January, and we're collecting a lot of information. We want to hear from you, and we want to know how we can not just tailor our plain language summary services and products, but also our other digital features to meet your needs as our customers. Uh, just 
I think I'll just finish up. I, there's so much I could talk about, uh, but again, I just want to acknowledge uh, the wonderful collaboration this past year. I worked with so many of the people, including those on the call today, uh, at uh, conferences and workshops and webinars to share information um, with audiences. And I think it's been fantastic getting back to in-person conferences. And I think it speaks to how much we can look forward to in 2023 in terms of what we can accomplish together. So on that note, I will turn it over back to Peter and I think on to Joanne. Excellent. Thanks, Kelly. Um, jo, go on then. You've been built up there. The spotlight's now on you. Go on. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, hi there. Um, I'm Joe Walker. Um, so it's been a bit of an unusual um, year for me, um, and I'm actually speaking today um, wearing sort of two different um, hats representing um, two different publishers. Um, so the first of which is um, the Future Science Group and also um, a new publisher um, called Vicaris Publishing, um, of which I am uh, very proud to be a um, co-founder. Um, like Kelly, um, I've been in publishing um, for, for a very long time and 2023 actually marks my sort of 25th year um, in, the, in the business. So um, in terms of Bacaris Publishing, so we started um, the company um, only recently back in September um, and this has been sort of um, formed um, alongside two colleagues from FSG, which is, um, who are, sorry, future uh, Phil Garner and um, Laura Dormer, and Laura um, was actually an author of um, GPP 2022. So we've acquired um, two products from FSG, very small, and we just have the Journal of Comparative Effectiveness Research and also a website called The Evidence Base. You know, so at Bacaris, our real focus is on the publication of um, real world ev evidence and health economics research, you know, across all areas, indications and stages um, of R&D. Um, JCR publishes, you know, a wide range of content types, you know, including research reviews, methodology studies, white papers and so on. And the journal is also flipping to um, gold open access uh, model from January. So all articles will be published on an open access basis and be sort of ready uh, readily available to read without subscription or pay-per-view, etc. We're also, um, you know, as all the publishers, other publishers are doing, we're sort of continuing our work on publishing um, digital features, such as videos, podcasts, and we'll also be building on our experience as well, um, the publishing the standalone um, plain language summaries. So alongside that role at Vicaris, I'm a busy woman, I'm also consulting um, on FSG on publishing the um, standalone PLSPs, which I set up um, with Laura Dormer um, a few years ago. You know, this year FSG really has been sort of um, bedding in the publication of PLSPs. You know, we've been refining the process, you know, improving on how these are published, you know, to ensure that the process really is as robust as possible. Um, and also, um, you know, taking the step to make sure these articles really are discovered, discoverable, and can be, you know, found by the people who want to read them. So since FSG started publishing um, PLSP sort of back in um, 2020, the company's published um, over 60 of these articles, and we've got almost the same number, if not more, um, in the pipeline. You know, there's just so much interest in these types of articles, you know, across the board, you know, we're seeing more interest from sponsors and also from academic authors themselves, you know, who are looking to explain their work. You know, patient author, patient groups as well are looking to sort of try to come to come to us as well, seeking this information. Um, and I think this is actually reflected in the overall metrics for these articles. You know, many of the PLSPs that have been published, you know, have several thousand downloads. And I just think it really shows that there's such a, a need and that people want to read this type of content. And what's interesting um, for me as well, sort of, um, you know, working across uh, across both FSG and Bacaris, is that you can sort of take a, a kind of bird's eye view of, you know, publishing as a whole. And what I've seen has been really interesting for me this year is just the very type of content that's being published. You know, it's not just clinical studies or, or reviews, but it's just much more sort of really sort of nuanced publications, you know, with, you know, real world evidence, there's studies, there's um, surveys, there's unmet needs, there's, you know, trial protocols, design papers, patient author publications. You know, as well as, as Jan said as well, you know, you have podcast articles and the plain language summaries. There's just this sort of whole mass of different article types. And from a publisher perspective, that brings with it a whole set of challenges. You know, who qualifies as an author? What are the ethics of publishing these? How are these publishers, how are these published? How do reviewers deal with that? So, uh, you know, I'm interested today to have a sort of conversation with other publishers to sort of see how, you know, what they're seeing and sort of what they're sort of dealing with those publications as well. So I'll pass back to you now, Peter. 
Brilliant, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, audience members today who are listening, uh, please do join in. Um, comments, questions, observations, use either the text boxes and we'll weave those into the um, into the conversation, um, which is just going to be freewheeling. Um, I guess we can ignore the fact you're all talking about PLS. <laughs> Lots but to say. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've stumbled at that point, right? So let's just address this up front, okay? The terminology, where I sit, the terminology still doesn't seem entirely clear. And I know I've gone on about this in the past and it's getting clearer. However, I'm trying to pick up on a couple of things that were said and not said within the conversation. So let's just explore this a little bit, okay? So people, are, in my opinion, people mix up PLS with patients or, or, they, or they, they say, you know, PLS equals patients. I don't think that's true. Um, and I don't think that's what any of you quite mean, but that is a little bit of the message that's coming over. But can we address this one up front? PLS for me is, uh, is just making it more accessible to a different, a wider audience. And sometimes that goes as far as patients and sometimes it doesn't and so on. Okay, so I'm getting a couple of nods. I'm gonna start with Jan and put you on the spot a little bit um, and say, what's your, you know, just pick that one up a little bit and run with it because I don't think you mean PLS is for patients when you talk about PLS. Absolutely, and it, may, it makes me laugh because um, I've been banging on about this for years. Plain language is plain language, whatever you know, that, that is decreed to be. And for example, the BBC a few years ago, um, to my impression at least, um, uh, started representing the material on, on their news website in a much more accessible way. And uh, they would have clear points at the top, maybe a video to facilitate understanding, and then more depth as, as you went down. But as far as we are concerned, plain language is information that is written in maybe a journalistic style with a lot of the, the hideous jargon removed, but not dumbed down. We're not talking about a reading age of eight. We are talking about writing in clear English. And to my view, that we all recognize the sweet spot when we see it. Okay, so Joe, bring you back in then, uh, as, as the person who's been, and, and we're all acknowledging your, your, your efforts in championing all of us, but are you agreeing with that or do you have a slightly different view on that? Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They should. It's not. Yeah, they're not for patients. These articles, PLS, plain language summaries, PLSPs, they're not for patients. They're more just a really easy way to read an article without, as, as Jan said, all that jargon. I mean, even if there is jargon, that jargon's explained <laughs> so that, you know, I, you know, PLSP shouldn't really be a learning tool as such. Oh, I think we've lost you, Jane. That's going to be irritating. You're still there. That's a really interesting way of describing that disease. So, oh, no, I'm still here. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Joe, we lost yeah, you a little sorry, bit. Yeah. Just, <laughs> no, just that's fine. So I think there. it's just, it, sorry, yeah, it's just, yeah, they're definitely not just for patients. It's just a really easy way to explain content. Yeah, without all the jargon, you know, perhaps using sort of images, figures, that's, I mean, I'm a visual learner. I like PLSPs because I like infographics, you know, looking at images, that sort of thing. That's how I learn. And I just think these are a really just a, a really interesting way to learn from the, without having all that jargon. And they, they are read by, you know, HCPs, just we don't want to. And also the way that the plain language summary in an article itself is right up the front. So you could read the abstract, but you might need to get a bit more information about the context where the plain language summary can put out a bit of context, that sort of thing. Okay. So okay. Another tool to, yeah. Okay, so that's fine. But as some, so, um, so then a couple of obvious questions fall out of this in terms of who are you actually pitching the PLS at and what sort of level of language and so on. I think Emma's come in with, you know, so who is it actually aimed at? Um, you know, can you, can you be specific? I mean, you know, we're, all, we're talking about this, it's more openly accessible and so on. Um, but how do you define that? How do you quantify that? Is there, is there a way, do you have some sort of rule of thumb that you're pitching at a certain sort of way? I, I don't know, you know, you know what I'm asking. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, or oh, go on, Jan, you wanted to jump in, but let's I was bring say, Are you talking about PLS or PLSP? Right, because okay, so talking... let's come back to that point. Okay, yeah. importantly, right. So yeah. PLSP is a bit of a new terminology that's just becoming tri quite trendy, right? Okay, so we all used to talk about PLS or not so long ago, we were talking about PLS. Now you're talking about PLSP. So let's just clarify then. But I think I know what you're going to say. Sorry. So yeah. you answer that question, Jan. What is a PLSP okay. as a PLS? So PLS is a plain language summary of a published article. Okay, so you've got your published article and usually a PLS 
no P, PLS appears just under the abstract, if you like, as a secondary abstract, I often talk about it as an executive summary. OK, you're going to your boss who doesn't know the detail, doesn't want to know the detail, but you certainly don't want to, to uh, approach this in very basic language. It needs to be clear with the key points. So a PLS that accompanies an article appears under the abstract, uh, summarises the article in clear language, but be clear, it says no more or no, no less than is, the, it, it is in the article itself. So it's a summary of the article. A PLSP is a summary of a published article. It's often a clinical trial article, perhaps a phase three, but it's effectively taking a, or providing a summary of, of that entire paper. And it's published as a standalone article in its own right. And as, and sorry, Joe, you should be saying this rather than me, but as Joe often says, it's a secondary publication for a totally different audience than the original one. The original one is for people with a high depth of knowledge, but it, this is for a separate audience who want um, the, 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 the article summarised in clear language in a way that's accessible. And we will often say that we are reader agnostic, but we believe that people looking in the peer reviewed literature, we, we are assuming a certain level of readership and we never move away from the fact that our key readership are healthcare professionals and allied, but that's a big spectrum. It can be specialists, non-specialists, non-native English speakers. It, it can be patient advocacy groups. Okay, okay. It, it, the okay. range. Okay, and let's also make the point, because someone will ask the question, that, that this is not lay summaries, as in terms of clinical trial registries and so on, which is also, but it tends to get mixed up with this as well, yeah. okay? Okay, so I'm understanding what you're saying. Um, Jim, Hamish, just come in and, and just give a, a viewpoint from your side of it, on, in terms of what we're talking about, PLSPs and yeah. PLS. Yeah, and I think somebody asked the question earlier, I mean, like, who, who are these actually aimed at? Um, and I think, you know, we're going to sort of give a sort of frustrating answer of a sort of quite a vague one of everyone, really. I mean, I don't think there is anyone who can't sort of benefit from plain language on some level as well, even, even if you're a specialist. Um, I mean, ultimately, is there a reason that we need to talk about everything in entirely technical language? Um, there are some things that obviously are going to be very difficult to describe in plain language all the time. Um, but I think, you know, like we've, we've made the point earlier about, you know, people who are time poor um, uh, and I think, you know, plain language is a really fantastic way to sort of cut through that. Um, so I think it's not just about non-specialists, it's not just about patients, it's about anyone who can benefit from plain language. Just I, go on, Kelly, go on. Have you got a viewpoint? And, and there's, a, there's a question that came in somewhere. I'm, I'm struggling to find it at the moment, um, which was very specifically, and, and, and I guess an obvious question. Why don't you just ask for abstracts in plain language anyway? Why, why, are we, why are we having these different levels? Why don't you just, and indeed, presumably logically, why don't you just have an article in plain language anyway? Um, well, Can you talk around that one for a moment? Yeah, let me talk around that one for a moment. And I do want to just back up and say that we've really seen such a proliferation of plain language summaries over the past, what, two to three years. I think that really corresponds with the COVID pandemic because we saw so much misinformation and disinformation being disseminated on social media. And it's not that necessarily a plain language summary or research is going to, you know, change the that type of information being available. But if we have a plain language summary that succinctly talks about what this research is in you know, clear jargon-free language that you know, a pretty wide audience can understand, we have a much better chance of communicating key research, especially like COVID-19, to people that are interested in it. Because I think we've seen, you know, it's no longer, uh, just the researchers talking about these topics now with you know the internet over the past well 20 years uh, you know lay audience are very actively involved in reading it and trying to understand it now going to you know do we get rid of a regular abstract no because it, the research is also for the researchers out there and those at that certain level in that specialty they want to know some of those gritty details and sometimes the only the thing they do look at is the abstract to decide whether they want to read the article further they want to know about the methodology they want to know some of those numbers from the results they want to dig into those details so what we're doing by including both the abstract and a plain language summary is making that accessible to a wider audience i think we sound like we're on repeat when we say that but that really is the goal uh, to, to to meet those different needs. And last thing I'll say really quickly, because I don't want 
take up all the time, but we talk about patience and I just have to remind people sometimes that we are patients ourselves. I'm a patient. So it's not a different set of people. It's when I'm out there talking to my doctor about my illness, I want to be able to look at a research article and make sure I understand it. And I work in the industry and still struggle at times. So that it when we talk about patients, audiences, that encompasses us as well. It's not a group sitting off to the side. I, I hope that makes sense. And I'd love to hear everybody else's perspectives. Okay, as I think I'm not sure if we've lost Joe. Um, anybody else I want to reply to Kelly there? Joe, uh, Jan, do you want to stick any, uh, put, put another viewpoint in there? Absolutely, to agree 100% with Kelly, that the peer-reviewed literature, literature is effectively a curated repository for all this material, and that's so much part, by the way, of what publishers do. It's not just publishing the here and now, it's making sure that data that was produced 10, 15, 100 years ago is still available in perpetuity. So it's important that it is there. It may be superseded, but it is there and people can track you know, the details. So yes, I'm afraid the detail is there. We might not know what the detail that's going to subsequently be important is. So it has to be there. The abstract, is, as Kelly says, is there as, a, as effectively a decision-making tool for, for researchers and and it's not for us to detract from that but it is for us to open up the accessibility of, of the key outcomes of, of the study so i'm absolutely okay with you. okay let's just pick up another um uh, well another interesting angle that usually comes up in these meetings which is how do the patients if we are going to patients let's go let's go to the patients right and accessing information um how are you or how are you seeing them accessing this information um, more easily now? Uh, what initiatives are around to try and open up access to PLS and so on? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, and I think this is actually probably where uh, there's maybe the biggest gap for PLS um, is uh, actually, you know, their discoverability. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, that easy for a patient um, or a non-specialist to sort of come and, come and find a PLS. Um, so, for example, some some people might be literate in PubMed, um, but I think, you know, me and Joe were talking the other day and, and we were sort of sharing some stats about how many patients um, sort of are able to use um, to use PubMed. Joe, do you, do you remember what the number was off the top of your head? I can't I can't remember, but I think it was I think it was some un published data though from PubMed right. um, so I but I can't exactly remember how much it was but I know it was quite low yeah yeah um, so it's, it's, uh, but I, then again I think there's still you know a number are using it <laughs> yeah so there's definitely a massive gap there but that's I think that's where the publishers are sort of you know we need to do our work and whether that's sort of outreach to um, patient organizations to sort of you know promote the information that way or um, you know I know some of us publishers have our own microsites where we amalgamate some of this content so for example at SAGE we have our patient accessible research microsite where we put all of our articles with infographics um, or uh, plain language summaries and things like that on there so I think people have to get slightly more creative than as, as compared to a standard paper. Okay, so it okay. depends on, on the patient and, and you know, there's such a spectrum. There are some who've just been diagnosed, they're recalling from shock. There are some that quite frankly don't want to know, but just maybe want to understand a little bit about the drug they're taking. And there are some who are so knowledgeable because maybe they're, they've got a chronic disease, uh, maybe it's a rare disease, uh, you know, where they'll know more than their primary care clinicians. So you know, that's why I, I say that we're agnostic in terms of who is accessing the information. But we are certainly, from the ages point of view, are not trying to educate patients at a basic level. We are trying to provide a service you know, for all those who are seeking information in the peer-reviewed literature. And of course, that involves or includes some um, patient advocacy groups as well. And we see those as, if you like, a, a, an intermediary to make our data more accessible as well. OK, I want to try and move on to a couple of different topics, but before I do, can we just have a practical point? And maybe Sorry, Peter, enough... can I just... Oh. I think there's a time delay there. Yes. Go, Joe, go. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, sorry, you know, I just wanted to um, add in that I think generally, you know, just not just for PLS or anything like that, but just across the board, I think authors and everybody needs to think about how they can actually make their paper more discoverable, you know, whether it's using a better title, you know, most people, you know, do come across research on Google. 
So, you know, and we've done, we, we've sort of got a survey that's going on and most people have created PLS on, on Google. So I think really trying to sort of maximize how you make your article discoverable, you know, using, right, all the key, all the, using all the right keywords in the title, that sort of thing, you know, to sort of really help your SEO, that is really important. And, you know, so if it's a, you know, if it's a podcast article, put podcast in the title. If it's a plain language summary, put plain language summary in the title, that, that sort of thing, really just People just need to make their articles stand out a bit more from others and make sure that they are making you know they are making it discoverable as well as publishers helping to make them discoverable as well, if, if you know what I mean. Okay. Can I'm I just come in with a practical oh. point and let's just move on a bit, okay, because we're going to run yeah. out of time. Um, I just wanted to cover off the obvious practical point and let's try and keep this very simple, okay, if we can, just for a moment. Uh, PLS in whatever format. Is this something you're sorting out at the beginning of the, pub of the publication process or is it something that you're adding into the publication process? So from a Medcoms agency or an author point of view, are they expected to provide the PLS with, um, is, you know, just give me a sense of how that varies. And Kelly, it looked like you want to jump in on that one. So go on. <laughs> sure. Um, what we say is start planning the PLS at the same time you're planning the manuscript itself. Uh, you know, one of the concerns with compliance is avoiding the appearance of cherry picking. I'm getting an echo there. Um, There's an echo. It's Joe. Sorry, Joe. You've got an echo coming. An echo there. Um, an echo. Oh, could you try mute? Is that gonna? Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. okay. Sorry, I, it's when you have that voice in your head repeating yourself to yourself. But anyway, planning it, it's, it's creating that selection criteria. So there's, if you're going to not have a PLS alongside every manuscript, having very set selection criteria of what manuscripts have a PLS, and then developing that PLS and writing it alongside the manuscript. What we say, or what I say, I should say, is that you should always have a text PLS because currently that's the only type of PLS that can be indexed on PubMed. So to make it as discoverable as possible, make sure that text PLS is indexed on PubMed and make sure you talk to the journal editor and that they're doing that. And that the journal also say, so make sure the journal supports PLS. We do find that we still have uh, authors that want to do a PLS post-publication and we accommodate that. We, we welcome post-publication PLS and I think now with the standalone PLS that's also going to give a lot more options for publishing PLS after an article has been published itself. Uh, infographic is obviously the most effective and popular type of uh, PLS. Uh, what we do at Taylor and Francis, I'm sure other publishers do this, is we host both. You can host a text PLS and also an infographic or image-based and text PLS. And that's on the home page. And whether the article is open access or not, those are freely available to view. And that echoes what the industry is doing, is making everything is the gold standard is having everything open access or freely available all right over to someone else to comment mm -hmm. <laughs> if i can just jump in to say absolutely agree kelly um we found in previous years um that certainly agencies were coming to us saying you know uh, we've been developing this paper on behalf of this company um but they don't want us to start the pls yet because you know, they don't know where it's going to go and whether that journal will will accept the pls i think where gpp 22 has really helped is by the supporting of, of pls and i think that is going to open up uh, the number of publishers you know, beyond us who will accept PLS. So hopefully it will, as, as Kelly suggests, become part of the routine development of, of the paper and not just something you think of at the end, because that never makes for you know, a, a good summary if it's just a bolt-on that you're doing in, in extremis. Okay, okay. Look, let's try and move on a bit from PLS. But um, a, a, an important point here is that if anyone is wondering um, in the audience or watching the video, you guys are the right guys to talk to, or certainly a good person to talk to at your companies about what your policies are and what you want. And it's worth making those pre-submission inquiries. Can I just make a, a general comment like that? Um, Absolutely. Because I think Absolutely. there's, I often hear people are not sure whether they should or shouldn't, and you know, but always the message from you guys is talk to us and at least we can work it out. Is that a fair point? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And okay. can I, and Hamish, you were saying yesterday about, you've now got data, haven't you, about how um, articles are more widely downloaded if they've got PLS. Is, is that yes. right? Yeah, yeah. So we work with a vendor who help us put them together and we have sort of cross-publisher data showing that, um, you know, the number of downloads PLS uh, dramatically, I think it's like up to three times higher. 
and altmetric scores are 7.5 times higher on average if you include a PLS. So it's making a really meaningful impact on you know, the ways in which people are sharing your uh, manuscript, but also the number of people viewing it. Absolutely. Okay. So the stage is coming and it also gives you a chance to control the message. You know, for people are looking for quick wins, including journalists. So if you've got the opportunity to control the message, why wouldn't you? But I'll shut up now, I promise. Okay, come on. Guys, because <laughs> all we're talking is PLS now, and there must be some, <laughs> we'll need to go on beyond this, okay? Um, having said that, PLS is really important. You'll find lots of content out there, you know, lots of discussion. Um, you know, we've done stuff, we'll undoubtedly be doing more uh, about PLS. This is, this is a, a, a work in action sort of thing. I mean, what, one thing that I would say is having talked to you guys or, or people like yourselves for the last few years, we, you know, PLS seems to have been talked about for a long time and suddenly this year, Frankly, it just seems to have exploded uh, for lots of reasons, I suspect. Let's not go into them for lots of reasons. I would like to pursue a particular angle on this. Kelly, I'm going to put you on the spot again because you mentioned it. Um, because And it leads on from PLS, OK? So accessibility to content and so on. You made a specific point about accessible publishing. And um, I just wondered whether you could pick up that for a moment. What do you mean by accessible point? You, you made some con comment in terms of people with disabilities and so on accessing the information. What did you, can you just pursue that one a little bit and get some input from the others after okay. that? But I think there's a wide variety of examples that of how we make research. And what we have to really go back is say, who is the audience for that particular research? And then work with the authors to say, how do we reach that audience? How do we make it the most accessible? Is that through a podcast? Is that through a specific audio? Is that through a video? Is that through specific images? My colleague Adeline Rosenberg at Oxford Pharmagenesis has did a great presentation at a workshop this fall showing all the ways that you can adapt uh, PLS, digital features, even articles to accommodate different needs. So it's, it's a little bit too much in the weeds to get into today. But I think, again, uh, as we've said throughout this discussion, you know, looking at the audience that you want that article PLS digital feature to reach and saying, how do we best do that? And, you know, publishing is no longer just publishing the art, putting the article out on, say, a website or in a print journal. It's, I think the publishers, the onus is now on us to make sure that those publications get into the hands of the people that need to, they need to reach. And we're still working on how we do that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else got a view on how to make information more accessible to disabled and there's a I mean this is a whole minefield yeah. because what does that mean anyway but any any comments specifically in terms of opening access in different ways to people who have ac problems accessing information go on Jan it looks like you want to well, I was really going to just broaden out to the whole patient centricity bits that for us it, 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 I guess what we're all trying to do is is publish information improves health outcomes so although our publications are never geared specifically at, at publishers at, sorry at, at patients we're, we're not gearing stuff at patients and um, with a, a lot of our journals being open access we are agnostic in terms of, of readers but we we are now increasingly publishing material that represents the patient voice um, some of that is is maybe podcasts where there's a a, a discussion between uh, some patients and and, and KOLs, um, or we also have patient physician pieces where half is written by a patient outlining their, their route to diagnosis, their treatment journey, their experience of living with the disease. The second half is written either by their treating clinician or another uh, KOL, talking about how um, the patient perspective informs their treatment decision making. And those can be really, really impactful. So ultimately, yeah, health outcomes are, 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 are focusing much more on you know, the patient perspective in, and improving outcomes comes that way and that is okay. so powerful I'm going to cut in again because it's interesting that we, we are, we're now talking about patients again yeah and what I was trying to talk about was accessibility <laughs> to the content and you know if you're a doctor or a nurse or a you know or whatever you may have problems accessing um, information as we go vi video for instance one of the things I'm very aware of at the moment is how many people want subtitling and captioning and so on and that just opens up its own minefield so it's not just about how do we access how do we give patients the access to information I'm interested in how do we actually are we are are we starting to recognize should we be recognizing more that you know there's a whole bunch of people out there who we've just assumed can read an article and, and can watch a video who actually may be struggling a little bit. And are you addressing that aspect? Do you understand what I mean? Am I making myself clear? 
Hamish, go on, give it, a, give it a go. Sure. Just a I mean, I guess there's 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 lots of things to consider. It's uh yeah, it's a it's a very interesting point. Um, and I think you know technology has a huge part to play here. So, for example, um, I think more and more people are starting to access research uh, using their mobile phones uh, or mobile devices rather than tablets. Um, just because it's much more convenient or on the go. Uh, so, you know, having a way to actually do that. Um, so, you know, if our, if our journal platforms are particularly accessible through mobile devices, uh, then we are then putting a barrier to uh, research accessibility in there. So I think that's a huge thing. And I'm sure, you know, over the years, we've all probably looked at our journal platforms and started to revamp them so that they are. Uh, in fact, we've just released a new UX specifically that is aimed around accessibility and a large part of that is mobile devices. But I think, you know, there's a there's a really interesting point that Kelly made earlier is, uh, you know, is identifying um, sort of your target audience and then also kind of working backwards from there. And then, you know, if you're sort of saying, OK, who do we want to specifically uh, look at and who do we specifically want to target? Uh, and then once you know that, you can then really sort of create solutions around that. So, for example, I, I don't know if you if you know that people um, are likely to read um, a, an article um, there's no point adding a plain language summary if you don't think that there are going to be many non-specialists in there and they all want to sort of read it in technical language, for example. Okay, again, I get what you're saying. And, and, and again, there's probably a, a, just a, a, a webinar in itself talking about some of this stuff. Um, and we're running out of time. So we've had a couple of questions coming in about English language slash translation slash, you know, what languages do you publish in, etc. So I get, I mean, Joe, just say a little bit about, you know, I don't know, English language versus other languages and, and, and the opportunities for people to publish in local languages versus languages other languages and, and, and the opportunities for people to publish in local languages. Uh, yeah, I think I've got a bit of a lag, but hopefully you can hear me okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, so, I mean, our journals, uh, FSG journals, Vicaris publishes in English language. That's the first language, as in most um, most journals. But for the, P again, PLSPs, we do, and also for all other, other articles, if that's an option, we do publish translations. And actually what we're finding is doing those translations for PLSPs in particular is quite, is quite tricky because because it's in plain language, how it's said in English might be different to how it's said in plain language in like Japanese or something like that. So we're actually finding that the translators have to sort of use their common sense a little bit when translating it rather than, you know, with a scientific manuscript, you just translate it because that's the, you know, it's how it's written is easier. But because it's the way things are said in plain Japanese, for instance, might be different to say, ways said in plain English. So those forms of translations, that's that is, we are actually finding that quite tricky, uh, more tricky than we did expect. Um, so I think, and and again as well, you know, we are sort of seeing, um, you know, for the translations that we have published, you know, there's there's good readability of this. But again, it's finding those translations. You know, people come to the English language, then they see oh, there's translations. So it's getting those translations out there in the first place is tricky. Okay. Okay, look, guys, we're over, and I know there's more we could talk about, um, and it's uh, I'm very frustrated at the moment because there's so much more I want to talk about. Um, but I'm going to have to be um, realistic and just go. Look, the purpose of a webinar like this is to throw some ideas out and give people food for thought, make sure that people understand who to contact and so on. And I'm going to draw a line to the recording of this video. Um, having said that, people in the audience today, please don't run away because we have got a few minutes to the top of the hour. Um, but really, really importantly, you guys are the people to talk to at your at your companies, and if people watching this know that they can contact you and follow up these questions and um, that's the whole well, part of the point of these webinars and um, you know LinkedIn is an easy way of doing it frankly um, so we'll reach out to each other um, but thank you very much and um, for today I'm going to draw the line thank you to you guys thanks to the audience if anybody's interested in what I'm up to medcomsnetworking.com is the best place to start um, and I'm always happy to hear from everybody so in these very strange times I'm going to wish you all um, uh, you know, uh, safe day, and uh, we'll stay in touch. But on that note, goodbye. Everyone, give a little wave. Bye bye.